Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay, fantastic. I'll just see if I can get my thing to start from the first slide. Hmm. I'm in a different operating system to what I, I usually use, so I can't get my thing to full screen. Anyway, I think you can see the slide anyway. Yeah, maybe right. in view. Yeah. Our view. It's, uh, it's actually, I did it before in the slideshow, but it's actually not letting me select it for some reason now. Not sure why. Anyway, I think we could probably just go go with it. Um, everyone can probably see that that clear enough. So thank you for for your interest in um, in wildlife drones. And what I'm going to do is just start off with uh, a bit of a, a background about sort of where wildlife drones came from. Um, I can hear some background noise from someone else and chatting in the background. Um, not sure what that's about. Uh, maybe that's because I've got two of these open. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. I don't know. Ah, oh, this is it here. There we go. Okay. So, yes, so um, I'm actually an ecologist, so I do um, ecological research and um, and this has led me sort of from my research into um, setting up my own startup company. So I thought I'd start with a, a bit of a background about um, about that journey that we've been on and where we are now and then I'll give you a run through of our user interface so you can see what's involved when you're trying to use our system. Um, so I, I do a lot of um, ecological research. I, I work on the swift parrot, which is a critically endangered bird, and it actually is a small migratory bird, and it migrates north for the winter, um, as opposed to those migrants that live in the northern hemisphere. And a part of my job was to understand where it was going and what it what it was doing in order to better to better manage that species and protect its habitat. Um, the issue is that swift parrots actually have a very dynamic uh, habitat use and movements and we know very, very little about that. So for example, here in southeastern Australia, we have swift parrots occurring down in, in uh, Victoria, which is a state in the south there. But then in the next year, they'll move, they can move up to a thousand kilometres northeast of where they typically reside um, to go and move into some drought refuge habitat. So Australia has a very um, extreme environment where it's really dry and then it can be really wet. And so the wildlife have adapted in order to move um, in response to that. But the challenges, uh, there's many challenges around that, but with um, in this slide here you can see that uh, it's actually in the suburbs, so where there's people's houses, there's not much habitat left, and so the birds are forced to use these really developed landscapes um, and often die from collisions with things. But one thing that we, we've never really been able to get a handle on is how they move across these massive areas, thousands of kilometres. These birds are not much bigger than the size of your hand um, and yet they manage to migrate every year to different locations depending on where the food is. So um, this is the inspiration to kind of try and find a better way of tracking animals. Because these animals are really small, um, most of the more advanced tracking technology is not suitable. So we have the brown tags you can see here which are satellite and GPS tags. They're way too big to put on a swift parrot. They're too heavy. The bird would not be able to fly with carrying these sorts of things. Um, the other types of tags are, are GPS loggers like the black square on the, on the top right or RFID tags or geolocators. All of these tags, those other tags, they're really tiny, but they don't transmit a signal. So you actually need to know exactly where that animal is to get any of the log data back off that. So um, for this bird that moves to different places in different years and um, you don't know quite where it's going to be, none of those technologies work. So the only thing we can use is the VHF transmitters or the very high frequency radio tags which is circled here in the red. So these can be quite small and for their entire life they send out a little pinging sound. And so what we really needed to do was to be able to track these little tags. 
The problem is that radio tracking these little tags is really, really labour intensive um, and it's very, very hard work. And so people will go to extremes to pick up this tiny, the faintest little ping of an animal's radio tag. And typically people will try and get to the highest point. So I'll do anything they can to get high. And what that means is that the line of sight between the antenna and the receiver and the animal tag is in increased and that means you get a better signal and so sometimes people will hire helicopters even just to find out generally where that animal is. They might get teams of people or even jump in a canoe if you really need to get a different perspective. It's not much higher but it's a different angle that might give you some advantage. So people will go all over the world are doing this type of work in order to better understand small animal movements. Um, and it's just not feasible for us to track swift parrots in this way. And so that's why we were inspired to try and create something new and different that would in empower us to go out there and do research and find out things that have never been found out before. I happened to be working um, with a colleague who uh, was, uh, although he was based in Australia at the time, was working on lions in Africa and we both came up and thought what would be fantastic if we could use a drone to do this work and this was about 10 years ago that we had this idea. So it's, it's really taken quite some time for this idea to become a reality. Um, but I, over a number, I had like three major grant applications. I gathered together a whole bunch of partners from across the globe um, who could help us to try and see whether it was possible to use a drone to radio track animals. So we got this project up and I worked with some roboticists who at the time were the only people who really had experience working with drones. And we developed our first system um, over a number of years. We slowly developed this um, and it's kind of an unusual looking drone that you can see here compared to the, the ones that you find these days. Um, so we, we developed a system, it was very small and lightweight um, and we did many, many iterations of the antenna, of the receiver, we did hundreds and hundreds of flights, changed the way we filter the signals, the algorithms that we used to process and find the location of the animals and we really did a lot of testing and on a runway, you can see here it's not exactly a natural environment but it was one in which we could start doing our experiments to figure out what was the most effective way of tracking. Then we moved into the, uh, into the woodlands and so um, this is the environment in which swift parrots tend to live in this sort of grassy woodlands and so we're like right we really need to be able to demonstrate this system within this environment and so we would get tags and we would throw them up into trees and we would peg them to logs and all sorts of things to try and replicate what it's like for an animal um, to track in, in this landscape. And we also, at the meantime, were also testing out the how we could attach these tags to swift parrots so that we could then be able to track them because people had never successfully tracked swift parrots before. However, we've got the radio tracking side of things right, but then we found out that we actually couldn't track swift parrots and not in the way that we were envisaging. And the reason for this was that the swift parrots are very prone to entanglement so we weren't able to put a harness on the bird which meant that they could hold the tag for a very long time and track their migratory movements. So we had to move away from the swift parrot, um, we, we hadn't figured out a way to do it but we had made some great progress in relation to the drone. So we thought well okay we can't track swift parrots right now but you know we're, we've made some ground so let, let's see what else we can do. So we found a more common bird that occurs in the woodland and we decided to try and they're quite territorial these are called noisy miners and um, we decided to track them you can see the little um, antenna sticking off the birds back there and typically it would lay down the back if the bird was sitting more upright. So we tagged these birds and really wanted to see what is the difference between you know, us putting a tag out and what it's like when it's on a, a living, breathing animal that moves all the time. And across the bottom here you can see on, on the left you get these beautiful smooth lines. This is the theoretical pattern of what we should see when we're getting hearing that pinging sound from the tag.
The middle one is when we had a tag just hanging in a tree or sitting on a log. And the one on the right is where it was the tag was actually attached to the bird. So you can see, uh, you might never have seen these kind of polar plots before, but the one on the right basically is much more noisy. It's much more difficult to kind of really hone in on that, that signal and determine, get some really accurate information from such a noisy data set. So there's lots of challenges there um, in terms of being able to pick up and actually locate these signals. However, what we found was that despite these noise, the noisiness in the signals, we could actually track these birds. So how it works is that we actually launch the drone wherever you need to, and then once it's in the air, you do a slow rotation where number one is, for example. And once you've done a whole rotation, you'll actually be able to tell which direction is the strong signal and which direction it is weakest, and therefore you get a bearing. You're able to get your first direction to the animal. You then fly the drone to a second location and repeat the process. It's quite simple, one to two minute rotations, and it can detect where the bird is, and you just keep doing that until you get intersecting lines, and then you get an estimate of where the animal is, like shown on this map. So we then actually, um, in the meantime, went, went about um, trying different attachment methods to swift parrots. Um, and here, you can, down on the bottom right, you can see there's a couple of tags on the back of those birds looking a little bit scruffy. Um, but these are, are captive birds. And we were able to actually tape the tags to the back feathers. And although it's not a long-term deployment method, um, it means that we could at least do short-term tracking and find out more about their movements when they're in their wintering area. So over the last couple of years, we've had a couple of projects where we've actually finally been able to track these amazing birds. And what we found from that is that although we, we knew some places where they were foraging, they're actually going off and roosting overnight on private property where it's not protected. And there's really, we've seen mass congregations of these birds by tracking them to where their roost is. All of the birds are coming in to roost together. And it's been really, um, really fascinating to find out that. But also, it's empowered us to contact those private landholders. And actually, they're really excited that these birds are on their property. And I have another conservation project on this on this particular species. So we've got some funds to actually give to landholders to help manage and protect their habitat there. So just being able to track these birds, even if it's only within the wintering area and the and the migratory movements still remain largely a mystery, we've been able to at least shed some light on these birds' movements. So that's um, just, just a, a, I guess, a rough, a rough overview um, about sort of how we, we've come to, to where we are. Um, and at the end of that project, we actually um, were contacted by people from right across the world really wanting to, um, to be able to use a system like this because they've been facing the same challenges as we had. And so I then um, set about educating myself on how do you set up a business, um, how do you uh, raise funds for such a project, um, and how do you translate what was really a research prototype into something that anybody in the world can use, make it really user friendly, um, and that type of thing. So that's what I've spent the last couple of years doing, um, is validating that idea and actually translating what is this, uh, this research prototype here. Um, we, at the end of that project, we actually discovered a whole raft of problems <laughs> with that system, as you do in any good research project. Um, and so what we have done over the last couple of years is really address all of those limitations um, and, and made sure that we had a, a much more robust system that could be applied anywhere in the world. So um, we now have um, a system that, that we can do that with, which is really exciting. Um, it's still in the, in the beta phase, so we're still um, continuously testing, improving, refining. But what I'm going to do now is just um, shift over to another screen and um, give, you an give you a bit of a feel for what it is like to, to use our system. So this here is our user interface. 
I'll just zoom out so you can see that this is um, in Australia. This is around where I'm I'm based. Um, so our, our user interface has um, been set up to be as user friendly as possible um, by anybody. So really all that is required is to obviously have the drone with our system mounted onto it, um, but that's a bit difficult to demonstrate on a webinar. Um, but it, it, it screws, into, screws onto the top of the drone and it has an antenna across the bottom and um, it, it, it attaches really, really robustly. And so it's, it's quite easy to fly. It doesn't make it any more complicated to fly the drone. So if you're used to flying, we, we use a Matrice DJI Matrice 210 is the, um, the main drone that we have it built for at the moment. But I think if you have a drone that has the capacity to carry the payload, then um, you could potentially use other, other platforms as well. The, the payload at the moment is around about one kilo, but that's by far the heaviest it's ever going to be. It's only going to get smaller and lighter from there. So this is our first um, sort of commercial prototype, if you like, that we've developed recently. So how it works is that you move from the top to the bottom um, with each of these tabs. There's three tabs. There's the pre-field, in-field and post-field. So the first thing to do though is to um, select a project. So you can select a project. Uh, we can just say it's going to be a test project and you can select a site. You can call these anything you like. Um, and what this is actually doing is creating a folder um, for all of your data that you're going to collect. Now one of the really key advantages of using our system, in addition to being in the air and maximising that direct line of sight, is that instead of tracking one animal at a time, you can actually track up to a hundred animals simultaneously. And so if you have a whole, um, a large number of animals in any particular area, you can save immense amounts of time because you can actually track all of them at the same time. So once you have these um, folders set up, all of the data for all of those animals will be saved automatically into that folder that you've set up. So we're in the pre-field. So before we go out in the field, there's a couple of things that you can do so that you don't have to fiddle around when you're out in the field. And if you, when you're out in the field, often there's no internet connectivity at all. And so um, this is set up so that when you do have access to the internet, you can uh, download the maps um, from our tile server and you can then when you're out in the field, you can see high resolution maps at any time for your whole study site. So what the, we go work our way down here and it says zoom in to download maps. So we literally just zoom in until we see this button change. So we'll just watch that button as I zoom in. Um, I just keep going in and in and once it changes we then it changes here to download maps so if I zoom back out you can see it says you have to zoom in a little bit more and then once you zoom in that little bit more you can see that you're getting a, a high resolution map there so you can see individual trees and, um, and roads and rivers and things like that so you can go in shift it around this is um, where I do a lot of my flight testing out here, so it's a big grassy, grassy woodland. Um, and we just push download maps. And it says, yep, you want to download those and you just go yes. And it, it then, uh, basically it's pulling the tiles off our tile server and putting them into a folder so that whenever you're out in the field, you'll, ac you'll have access to these high resolution maps. And you can check the area that you've downloaded. You can see that there's a line there now. I'll just zoom out a bit so you can see that. You can see I've downloaded this area before. Um, but that area there is, is um, we're now offline. Um, you can go offline and you can see it's white around it and just shows you the area that you've downloaded. If you think, oh, actually, I need a bit more space, you can just go back online and move it around to wherever you need and you can you can download some more. You can line up the edges if you like so you don't get too much overlap and just do another download. And you just can just keep doing that as much as you need to to cover, to cover your study site. Um, and, and once you've done that, then um, 
the next step is to to then think about the tags that you're going to be tracking. So typically, when people go out radio tracking, they order some tags in advance um, and so they know what frequencies they're going to be getting or when you get them you'll, you'll find out what frequencies they are. And they're typically an individual frequency and depending on where you are in the world, it, there's typically some regulations around what uh, range of frequencies you're allowed to use. Here in Australia, we're only allowed to use the, the 150 to 152 megahertz band, um, but it doesn't really matter. Our system can track um, tags within any two megahertz band at a time. And so, um, yeah, no matter where you are, we, our system can, can track your tags if it's a very high frequency tag. So the next thing is to actually import, you can either import a CSV file that you already have with all the tag frequencies in it or you can enter the data yourself manually and actually create that file. So here's an example where there's four tags. You can actually edit each of these. Um, for example, you might you can actually track different species. So you might have a let's just use some generic terms. So we have a parrot there um, on this first one. The next one might be an iguana or something like that. Um, whatever you might have in your area, you can put whatever labels you like in in this section here. Uh, whatever is meaningful for you and often there are um, reference numbers. So for example, this might be you know, 152 um, um, and yeah, it could be a kangaroo. It doesn't really matter what animal it is, if it's within range, we'll be able to radio track it. So you can just enter whatever information is meaningful there for you and that information will be displayed on the map as soon as you get locations for those animals. So we just have to save it and when we push save, it's actually saving it to our, um, to our folder. So then we just, we're, we're already prepped, that's all you have to do. You might want to think about where you want to fly or the area that you want to cover. But unlike a lot of visual drone work, this is a listening drone. So we actually don't want to spend all our time going backwards and forwards in a lawnmower pattern or, uh, like this. We don't want to do that because you're wasting all of our flight time going backwards and forwards and you're not necessarily getting a good angle on where the animals are. So what you want to do is maybe rotate here and get a different angle, rotate here and here and you can cover this entire area. So um, it's a bit different in terms of your strategy when you're flying but potentially a lot simpler because you don't actually have to cover at all and in fact our system is best um, when it's not particularly close to the animals that you're trying to, to track. So if you're, uh, you don't want to disturb the behaviour of that animal, you want to be able to find out where it is without disturbing it. And in order to get the best direction, you actually want to stay away from where the animals are so that you can get some nice angles towards their location. So once you, you're out in the field, you can then um, send your tag information. So you just click on the send the tag. Is that going to work? Oh, for some reason it's not working. Uh, surface. Ah, here we go, sorry. Okay, I just have to go to my simulator because it's, we're not really out in the bush. Um, we send those tags to the payload and then we just push start tracking. So at this point you're out in the field, you have the drone there ready to go, you have the antenna on the legs, the receiver screwed onto the top and a cable that goes between them so you can get the signal to the receiver and you can start the drone up and then you can start tracking. So you just push this button here and you can see down the bottom here that this chart pops up. Now this chart is actually indicating the signals from each of these four tags that we input. Although you can see this tag has just got a nice strong signal. This peak means we're picking up that signal. Likewise for this one. The third tag is not quite as powerful as the other two. The peak is a little bit lower. 
and this one there is no peak so we are not picking up this one so this animal has moved well away and is not in range but these other three animals are so what's happening now is that the drone is is up and it's flying around um, moving to the first location where it's going to start to rotate and you can see down the bottom here it says acquiring so this means that we've started doing the rotation the packets is the number of data packets that are being sent down so every three to five seconds there is an update provided direct from what's on the drone to on what is on the the laptop base station what we're looking at here you can see the bearing of the yaw of the um, of the system and it will keep changing as it goes around and around in a circle and once you've gone far enough around in a circle to get a complete picture of where all the signal strengths are this will actually change to it will be good, it changes to ready it says okay it's ready now you can actually move the drone to the next location I'll just show you on the legend here so you can click over here and there's a bit of a legend and we can also just uh, turn off those lines that you can see on the map because they're a bit distracting when you're out there tracking. So once you have, um, just move that back out of the way. The other thing you can do while you're here and, and out tracking, you can zoom in to any one of these signals. And so you can see that um, there's two lines here. The, the red line is the maximum signal that we've received to date and the bottom line is the signal right now so what we expect to see when we're turning the drone is for the blue line to go up and it'll reach the maximum and then it will go down and it's that difference in the signal that gives us our bearing and so I just you can reset that so you can zoom in to any one of these um, any one of these little signals there I'll just come out a little bit so you see the whole site and there's also some some buttons here that enable you to, to download CSV and KML files if you need it so what you can see here is that from the first rotation because you can't tell how far away a signal is from one bearing it just gives you an arrow pointing in the direction of where each of those tags signals are coming from now you can click on these arrows and you get all of the information that's available um, in in our map file and I'll just point to a couple of things one is the tag frequency so that's the the actual frequency of the tag that you're tracking um, and the other information that we input at the start and then this is this is the key information that most people are looking for this is the um, the lat the estimated latitude and longitude of of that tag now it says error 9999 that just means that it's a bearing only so it's a bearing in that direction and you can click on each of these and see the different information that's in there um, so you can click if you're not sure which ones which sometimes the colors might not be that great to differentiate between the two um, For two different tags and you can just always click on them So what's happened now is that the drone um, is then you can going and doing another rotation and you can zoom in on this other one So This one's actually a little bit to the side the line here is is the actual uh, frequency that the tag is supposed to be or what we were told that the tag is but in reality it's slightly off to the left now this is a, this happens sometimes with our radio tags that they actually do drift and so we actually have we input the tag frequency we're given but we actually collect signal information either side of that as well to capture make sure that we capture these tags regardless of how much drift they might experience so as the drone goes and does more rotations you see we've got a, a different bearing now from a different location once these these lines start intersecting then we'll actually get an estimate of the the point the location where the where the tag is so it will just keep going there 
and you can actually hide the radio signal at the bottom if you're just actually not interested in that you just want to see what the results are you might want a full, more full map you can just simply click on this button here and it will it will change it there's also an information button here to just to tell you um, a bit more about what you can do with this because you can also uh, double click on that chart and see it really huge I find the zoom in function is, is typically most useful though you can just exit out of that so it's continuing to track there and there's a there's a number of other buttons here so there's a, um, a stop tracking save data so once we've got some um, locations showing up on the map and we feel confident with with what we've got there and if you push this stop tracking save data button what happens is that the um, all of the information that has been collected on the drone is then pulled off the drone um, as, a, as a backup for, in addition to what's already on the base station and saved to your folder so you have the raw data as well as the process data there's a number of files um, in fact I can show you that um, they can go to the so for example at my white box site so there's four files that typically come off there's the plot file which is the plot that you see across the bottom of the map there's the map file which has all of those locations that everyone looks for and everyone wants to know where those animals are there's the data file which is the, all the data as it comes into the payload I'm um, sorry into the base and it's put together um, that's compiled but for example if you flew the drone a long way away you might be able to do beyond line of sight where you are um, it might have gone outside of the communication range when it comes back into range it will reconnect and, and catch up um, and so when, when you say stop save this raw data file comes off the drone as well so even if it goes away and maybe one or two of those data packets might be mi missed um, when it's doing the processing that you actually make sure that you have a complete set so there's a bit of a backup built in there whenever um, for whenever you're out there so if we go back to our map you can see that we've now um, got estimates of the locations of each of those so we can zoom in to that data we just push this zoom to data button and it will go in so there's a, a point in the middle which is the estimated location and there's a circle around it which gives you an error measurement as to how confident we are that it's in that location and again you can go in and see that um, different tag information the coordinates there so if you have somebody who might need to go and catch that animal and replace their tag you could give them that that reading that coordinate in real time if they're able to find that using a GPS or um, or a map um, so you can actually go and find the animal uh, quite quickly once you've got this this information coming through so that's how it works there and then when we push um, stop tracking save data that's all the files have just been saved to that folder there's also a button here called recover data it's, it's just a bit of a backup really so if for any reason say the battery went flat although the battery will, will go for a long time um, with, although the drone battery will often go you know 17 20 minutes flight um, our battery on our system is it's independent of the drone and it can actually it can go for half a day it can go for four hours or so um, and we have we provide a number of number of batteries so they can be interchanged um, so you don't have to recharge all the time but we just use a little power pack that is quite a, a standard sort of power pack that um, that you buy for charging mobile phones it's that kind of a battery um, so we use that and, and all of it is independent of the drone so there's no the drone is controlled by the controller as it normally is but our system operates completely independently and that means that when you land the drone and have to change the batteries you don't have to stop our system you can if you want but if you actually want to keep tracking data or you might have just picked up an animal and you want to keep using that data you can keep flying again and again um, with our system without actually having to turn it off 
So I find that really beneficial when I'm out um, tracking things that are covering quite a big area. But if you ever do have any issues and for some reason um, the, the, the battery went flat or something got unplugged, then there is this button here saying recover data. So that just means at any point in time if you've got some files that are on the drone and they weren't saved, you can push that button and it will save them for you so that you have that, that backup. So once you've got this data and you're, and you're happy with that, you can, um, if that can be it for the day or you might want to move to another site and find some different animals. But we also have this post field section. So when you go out into, um, into a site, you might not remember or you might not have been the person who was there when the tracking was last done. And so you might want to load a previous map and actually have a look at where, um, where those those animals were and so that that can be quite handy or if for some reason something went wrong and it didn't um, process you can actually reprocess the data as well and, and get the results um, afterwards if if you needed to so there's a number there's lots of backups <laughs> um, built into the system so that um, when you're out there you you make sure that you don't lose that data which is um, which is really valuable. So that's um, that's pretty much what everything that's there. The other, only other thing is to just shut down the the payload. You simply push that, um, and that that closes it all down, and you can unplug it. So that's um, how you use our system. And um, I'm really keen to to hear from from everyone out there about um, what ideas they might have or what interests they might have on how this, this may be of value to them. I can see that lots of people have had um, some issues during this. <laughs> I think. Um... Hi, Debbie. We can actually hear birds in the background. <laughs> um, I think Tiam was also quite interested, but um, he had to leave because of connection issues. But I'm sure I'll listen to the recording and, and have some questions. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, happy to. I'd like to see drone setup process. Yeah, sure. Look, we have a um, we have done up a bit of a video actually on how to set it up, um, so that you can you can see that. Um, can you actually see my? You're still looking at my screen, I think. If I could actually show you, I could get get a drone and show you what it looks like if you like. Would you like me to grab the drone? I'm not sure if there's a response there or not. I can't hear anything. Um. Yes, please show the drone. Okay, I'll be back in a sec. Um, would you like me to stop the screen sharing? Yes, if you stop the screen sharing, then I can actually show show the setup on the drone. I was out flying this afternoon, so I have it here okay. with me. Uh, okay, can everyone see me there? <laughs> it's a bit hard to do it with the headphone connected. That. Yeah. So what we have here, turn it up. So we have the Matrice 210, um, and basically there's some gimbal mounts on the top here yeah. um, that screw into the the top of the drone. The top of the drone. And the um, 
the payload actually just screws into those top rails on the gimbal mount. So it's really secure and we had some people using them last week um, out in the desert tracking some feral cats and um, they had to manoeuvre quite quickly because there was a an eagle coming at the drone <laughs> and um, they were very impressed with how it handled with um, with the payload on board and you can see across the legs here we just simply have the antenna uh, using cable ties at the moment um, to just tie it on across the base of the legs so we have the receiver at the top there's a cable that comes down from the receiver to the antenna and that's that's what it looks like <laughs> um, we've got the external GPS on there because there is the the payload is on top um, and and can block the the internal GPS on the drone but that um, came with the drone when we got it um, but yeah we can actually share share a link with you that um, shows you step by step how you actually put it on the drone it's it's relatively simple there's a few screws and things to do at the moment ultimately we would really love to have a, a quick release mechanism so you can just clip it on and clip it off um, but at the moment it's it's a screw on system but it, it is very secure so um, that's been been quite good keen to know more about the sensor you use may have missed it um, so the sensor is a it's a radio receiver system so we have a VHF antenna which is the, that big antenna across the, the base of the legs and the, um, <coughs> the radio receiver is, is, a, is a custom receiver that we have built so it actually takes the, the VHF radio signals um, and then it, it's processing, does a little bit of processing on the drone to package it up and send it to the base station but then after that it actually get, gets run through some algorithms to do the, the signal localization and identify how, uh, figure out how or where the animal is located across the landscape. Um, so it's a, it's a um, yeah, radio receiver up on top with an antenna, VHF antenna down below. Um, if you have more specific questions I can answer that as well but as I said there's a, usually a 2 megahertz band in Australia it's 150 to 152 megahertz that we can track and uh, we, we can filter whichever frequency bands are required. Um, there is a possibility as well of potentially tracking UHF signals. In fact, the antenna would be smaller and therefore lighter. Um, when tracking with the drone, we could actually use our same core technology to track the HF, uh, UHF signals. So um, there is scope for tracking a broader range of animals, potentially cattle. Um, we, we haven't actually tracked cattle per se at this point, but it's something that we're interested in perhaps exploring as well. Yeah, sure. I certainly will can send, um, I'll send a link um, and everyone, everyone who's here and those who couldn't make it as well can, can check out some, some videos. Um, I wonder if I could actually... I might just see if I can find um, find a link that I can share with you right now. Actually, For so tracking mongooses, yeah, that would be um, that would be a great use of this system. If we have um, we have had a range of different things from across the globe, which has been fascinating to hear about people's challenges. Um, so at the moment, we've, uh, recently we've been um, doing some testing with some armadillo tags from Brazil, um, and that was an interesting one because these giant armadillos actually. Um, live underground and they know almost nothing about their movements and so we actually 
they sent us some tags and we attached it to a pole and we, we put it up inside a, a wombat burrow, which is the closest thing I could find um, here in Australia, and to see if we could actually pick up, um, pick up the tags. Uh, even though it was underground and it was pretty great because uh, we were able to pick, pick up the tags indeed so it was um, it was really nice to be able to, to demonstrate that and they weren't sure if we were even going to be able to, de to pick up the detect the signals but uh, I was pretty confident with that because we can pick up any VHF signal that um, from any tags it doesn't matter who makes them so people can actually use their their own tags um, the preferred tags that they like and and we can we can track them so actually I have a video here actually this is a um, armadillo test tag video so this is six minutes long um, or maybe we might Actually, I might just go to uh, Yes, I can um, provide you with a couple of references from some of our original prototypes. And I'll start. Actually, I've got the. This was a video that we did from um, when I was in the Swift Pratt tracking more recently. I'll just hide these other things. Any impact you can think of on the natural environment, um, you know, these birds, their habitat is subject to those. So the movements are such a, an integral and important part of their life cycle that we know nothing about. When people have tried to track them, they have put the tag on the bird and then never seen them again. Like they just got up and you see it. And it called a swift for a reason. <laughs> so you can using a drone. Um, because when you're radio tracking and walking around for hours on end with your arm up in the air, listening by the sound, um, you really realise there's got to be a better way. And what you what you tend to be doing is trying to find high ground. So the higher you are, the better you uh, signal you will get. Um, and so with the drone, the idea is that you can launch the drone wherever you are, and you have that high point without having to scale mountains or climb on top of your car or hire helicopters. Um, you can now have this small lightweight tool that you can take out with you and, um, and take it wherever you need to be and really rapidly get very confident about whether or not the birds are in that place.
Okay, so that was um, was one of them. Um, I wonder if there's more more questions around that. I can send some other links around, and you can watch them um, at at your leisure um, for actually how you put the thing on the drone, um, and also some other examples of it in flight, if you like. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Any other questions from the participants here? So I will share the recording with everyone else afterwards. And uh, so if you have questions, then you can contact me or Debbie directly later on as well. Ah, question from Debbie, uh, no, Stefan. Uh, what is the maximum distance to receive? That really depends on the tags. So, um, for example, the Swift product tags, they weigh about 1.6 grams, and we can get them from half a kilometre away in an open sort of woodland. If you have a bigger tag, you can pick it up from further away. Um, so it really um, it depends on the tag as to how far, um, and also the landscape. So if you are in a, a tropical landscape, we haven't tried our system within that yet. Yet. Although in um, late October we're heading to Vietnam to test out our system within a, a really dense tropical forest, so it'll be really interesting to see how it goes in in that setting. So we'll definitely be keen to um, find out what the distance, how it impacts on the distance in those different landscapes. So most of the testing I've done is in that sort of open grassy woodland so far, um, but that's why we're really interested to get more and more people have a go using it um, and see see how it how it works in in different landscapes if it's really rocky so for example if you have rocky gorges or big swamps or anywhere where it's really inaccessible um, and you can just fly the drone over there then you can um, certainly get a lot closer and a lot easier than you would be able to if you were tracking manually yeah I hope that answered your question Stefan Great. Um, yes, yeah, so and we, we do have a, a web page. We're, we're going to upgrade our, our web page um, soon. We're kind of in the processes of it all. We're, we're just really at the very beginning of our journey, and so it's really exciting to actually um, be connecting with you now um, because we're really getting getting people um, to to try it out in, in different landscapes. I'm, I'm sending one off tomorrow to somebody else and um, so yeah it's a really exciting time to see how it might be used for a whole range of different species. Um, and you, you all, you are welcome to to contact me directly with any questions you might have afterwards, or anyone else who wasn't able to make it um, this evening. Be more than happy for people to to email me. I can put my um, email address here. Um, at wildlifedrones.net. Um, so yeah, anyone can any questions you might have or specific things about your site or what have you, just um, feel free to to get in touch and we can um, certainly try and help you with some more information. Okay, thank you very much, Debbie, and thank, thank you, you uh, for everyone for participating this for this webinar. That's wonderful. Uh, Thanks so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, so I wish everyone a great day, uh, a great week ahead. Thank you. Have a great night. Okay. See you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye.